Morning, church family. Beautiful day out today, sun shining, makes you feel loved and warm. Is that not true? Good to have our folks watching online today. I know quite a few folks are out uh, doing different things, and it's the season. Some people will be traveling, some people are visiting family, holidays coming up. We're so glad that we can do it online, though, and that you can also watch on the podcast in different ways later in the week. And, uh, but again, thank you for being here on site with us. If you're, again, new with us, welcome to Victory. We're glad that you're trying us out and seeing what we're like. Father, today, as we look into your word, we speak a blessing of your word. May it be something that will encourage us, maybe something that will strengthen us, something that will challenge us in Jesus' name. And everybody said... This is the last of this series. We've been talking about uh, last things first. And this is the fourth part of this message. And we're dealing with what would you say and who would you talk to if you knew that you only had so much time left on this earth? If you knew that you were going home to be with the Lord and it was about an hour, two hours, whatever it would be, who would you go to see? And what would be some of the things that you would say that would be important? We've been looking at uh, Jesus, before he uh, was crucified, what happened on the cross, and even days before that were some of the things he said to his disciples and those he loved. Then we also looked at what it was like after he rose from the dead and getting ready to ascend, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit deeper. But here's some of the thoughts that he talked about. He thought it was very important to make disciples. He thought it was very important to talk about water baptism. He also established communion, a time that we could remember him. And then this group of women and Apostle John gathered at the foot of the cross, and he had conversations that he was having even on that cross, and they were hearing that. One of the key things that I thought was so important is Jesus is dying on that cross. He looks at Mary and to John and tells that, Mary, now this is the home that you can go to, and John, please receive my mother to your house, taking care of his mama before he passed away, before he died. And then we had the fun of last week looking at Peter. Don't we love looking at Peter? And we looked at how Peter and Jesus interacted with one another and their, some of their final conversations. And it's interesting that Peter and, John, uh, Peter and Jesus talked about forgiveness, repentance, love, and a great word that we all enjoy, obedience. Somebody say obedience. Today we're looking at uh, something that took place, and we've been talking about quite a while, the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit, and today we're going to be looking at that, the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit. These are parting words we're going to read here in a moment. Jesus is now getting ready to ascend into heaven. He had been appearing to the disciples over 40 days, and over that period of time, he was talking to them and, and eating with them and fellowshipping with them. He was proving to them that he actually was a resurrected Savior, resurrected body. And this is where we go to Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And I'll pause for a moment there, because but to wait is the title of the message today. He asked them to wait which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, which we did a few weeks ago here. It was a wonderful time. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, and saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Their brain is going somewhere else. They're in the middle of where they're in the midst of Romans and issues and pressures, and they're thinking, he's going to restore. This is the time. He's going to take command. And he said to them, I love how Jesus is just so blunt. It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Basically saying, it's really none of your business right now. It's Papa's business. And we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about something else. And he comes back around, brings him back around again and says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So as we look at last 
things first. These are some of the final thoughts that Jesus is communicating. And he says, but to wait. How many of you love to wait? How many of you love to wait? Especially, you know, some of my, I, I so often tell you my, my faux pas and things that I don't do well. Uh, one of the, there's two areas that I really struggle. I, I, I'm better than I used to be. One is at a fast food uh, checkout, you know, the drive through I mean, it's supposed to be fast. And, and, and when you pull up to that instruction, what do you call it, not the instruction, but the screen, and you're supposed to order, come on! How many of us ordered from that screen hundreds of times that we're going to stand there and look? Yeah, do I really want the Whopper? Do I want the Whopper with cheese? Do I want the Whopper and cheese? Come on, just order. And some people take so long, just struggling to wait. The other place is I really, boy, I got to get better. I'm not good at this one. Especially when the pandemic was in full swing. We, we, lo we love our Amish neighbors. Say we love our Amish neighbors. We love our Amish neighbors. Amen. <laughs> but that's when the bank doors were closed. You couldn't go in. And, and the Amish literally on Saturday morning would line up at the drive through Not in their buggies, just physically. So you're talking now 30 different Amish people waiting in line at the drive through It's not like four cars. You're talking 30 Amishmen. And I'm just pointing to go, I'm never doing this again. Not on Saturday morning. I'm going to find a different way to go. But that waiting that we had to do, gosh, in Newcastle, I waited for a half hour through a drive through There were three lines of cars going through this particular bank waiting. Sometimes we really struggle to wait. Am I alone in that? There's some others that have your little pet peeves. All right, three of you are being honest. The rest of you, you can deal with lying later on. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Now, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood with them in white apparel. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Do you think that kind of, you know, we sit there and go, oh, yeah, look at him go. That must have freaked them out. I mean, he's, he's, he's being lifted up into the air going into the clouds and disappearing. Wait a second, Jesus, come back. You're supposed to take over here. You're leaving us. What's going on? And he goes off. We all just think it's kind of like, Ooh, the music's playing. I wonder what they were saying to each other at that point. That, that must have been kind of a wild time. And then, then, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, and we're flipping out, as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in a like manner as you saw him go into heaven, the ascension taking place. All kind of, I'd really like to know what that must have been like. Steadfastly gazing up into heaven with their mouths wide open. He's gone. He's gone. Well, if we go back to the previous scripture, who was Jesus speaking to when he talked about the promise of the Father? He was talking to the disciples. So if we ended things right there, that he was talking to the disciples, we could say, okay, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it ends there, and that's it. But it doesn't end there. And aren't we glad of that? Today is Pentecost Sunday. You can see the, the dove that's on the cross that my wife so beautifully puts up there. It's the, it was the Jewish feast of Shabbat. It is. Celebrates the giving of the law to Moses and the trumpets and the voice of God. It's the coming in the New, the New Testament of the Holy Spirit, the church's birth. It's the 50th day after Passover. Now, the disciples were told to but to wait, and now they're waiting. They're in that room together, gathered together. And we pick up in Scripture again in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you're following on in your notes there, the disciples were filled. 
If we can go ahead to that video clip, please. Once upon a time, there was a great wind, a mighty life-giving energy that breathed everything into existence, a power that moved along the waters of the deep, the Spirit of God. One day, a group who loved God was praying and meeting, celebrating a Jewish feast with friends and family, unaware of what was going to happen. Heaven was about to pay a visit. A violent wind filled the room where they prayed. Tongues of fire descended, separated, and rested on each of them. The Spirit of God didn't just come near them. The Spirit filled them. And each one began to speak in a foreign language, the many languages of all the people who lived in Jerusalem. All those who passed by marveled at what they saw. How could it be that each one could hear their own native language at the same time? Some claimed it was miraculous. Others scoffed and called them drunk. But Peter stepped forward and boldly proclaimed the truth. What the scripture described long ago had now come to pass right before their eyes. I will pour out my spirit, the Lord told his people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Here was the moment. The power of God filled the faithful. The body of Christ rose up alive and active, equipped and empowered to love God, to love others. The good news continues to be proclaimed. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the best news is, for those who believe, the story never ends. This was not just a time and history of an event that happened at Pentecost. I mean, if we look at that scripture again, and we're, we're following along. Let's continue on a little bit. Let's go to Acts 2 again, where we, that's, that's the particular video was talking. Peter replied, repent. Now he's talking to this crowd because there would have been a, a large crowd of Jews that would have been gathering, celebrating Pentecost. And that crowd was, some of them were confused, obviously, what was happening. As he began to preach, he said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It's salvation. It's being water baptized and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we know that he was at this point, who was he speaking to? Earlier, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Now he's speaking to the crowd. For you and your children, that crowd in Jerusalem, and we could stop there and say, okay, then Pentecost was for that period, for that time to establish the church, to get things moving. It's over with. No. Peter goes on to say, and Scripture goes on to talk about, what does it say? For all. Say with me, all. All. For all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So you can't say it's not for today. It's for us today also. Pentecost. The filling of the Holy Spirit, being baptized with Holy Spirit is for all of us. Let's ask you a question, because we could pause there again and say, well, that's nice. Could, without a show of hands, maybe just by an amen, how many in this room have been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Could you not just say amen? amen? So you can see it's not just something many of us in this room, in fact, most of us in this room have experienced what's called the baptism with the Holy Spirit being filled with the Spirit. It's something for us today. Interesting thought. The Assemblies of God is the largest denomination in the world. The largest. And we are part of that. And why is that? Could it be that they live out the last words of Christ before he ascended into heaven? Could that possibly be it? So let's just take a few moments. Let's, let's talk about what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit lives in us at salvation. He comes and dwells within us. Scripture says very clearly in Ephesians, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 
Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Basically, what he's saying there in Scripture is that when you become born again, when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you. In fact, the good news is it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity lives inside of you. Isn't that good news? Man, that's a lot living inside of you as a follower, but that's what the Scripture says. You want a testimony? Good testimony. So I, uh, one of our families in the church has been praying for her dad to come to know Christ. He has been sick, this particular gentleman, and uh, not feeling well. In fact, uh, not sure he was going to make it through the surgery that he went through. And this last week, Pastor Bill, Bill Kirker, and I were in a meeting, and we were talking about this particular gentleman and the, the, the mother or the uh, daughter of this uh, particular man. As we were talking, I felt like, you know what? We need to move on this. And unfortunately, Bob's not here today. Maybe Bob's watching online. But I felt the Lord saying, send Bob Filson to the nursing home. So I sent Bob Filson to the nursing home to talk to Ron. And while he was there, he met with this person. I, I'm not going to give you who the name is because, anyway, there's a reason why I'm not doing that fully. But Ron was there with his wife, and as this, Bob walked in, Bob looked at, at the woman, the, the uh, wife, and said, hey, uh, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? And she says, yes, I do. Looked at Ron at this point and said, Ron, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he goes, I do not. And he said, Would, let me talk to you about that. Would you like to accept Christ into your life right now? And Ron said, yes. So, no, come on, that's worth a praise. So that gentleman gave his life to Christ. And you say, oh, that's good news. Well, it is good news. It's good news as we pray for people. That's what this salvation lamp is. And we light this as we pray for those in there that we love. But this has been a burden on this daughter's heart for a long time. And I'm sitting there saying, God, what do you want us to do? How, how, what is the connection for this gentleman named Ron to come to know Christ? And just like we say, you know, we're talking about hearing the voice of God, learning to sense when God says something. As clear as a bell in that meeting, I knew that Bob was supposed to go in. And Bob, as bold as he is, led him to Christ. So can we give it up again to the Lord for that? Amen. It's really what we're about, seeing people come into relationship with Christ. But let's go back to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is being, with being baptized is flowing, Him flowing through you and out of you. In, in the Greek, baptism is baptizo, which means to immerse or to die, or to die, D-Y-E. It's immersion in the Holy Spirit. It's being immersed in the Spirit of God. It's surrendering, it's yielding to the Holy Spirit. Now, it's another experience. Christ living in you, Father living in you, Holy Spirit coming and dwelling in you as a born-again person, that happens. This is another opportunity for you to move forward in the presence of God and Him being inside of you. Let's go to Acts chapter 8, verse 14. You may say, well, is that really scriptural? Let's move on in the book of Acts. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here we have a clear scripture that's saying these folks in Samaria had accepted Christ as their Savior, and they'd been baptized. And then it goes on to say what? Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. That was the filling of the Holy Spirit. Another encounter with God. Isn't it cool that we can continue on our journey with God, and there's encounters with Him? There are, there's life-giving times with God. Let's look at another situation. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Now, Peter's preaching to Cornelius' household. He says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been, given, been, given, had been poured out even on the Gentiles. 
For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So here's another situation that they come to know Christ, and right after they come to know Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. And boom, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. So there's another encounter that's available to the body of Christ. But why would we want to do that? Why would you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at a few things of why that might be. In Acts chapter 1, we read this earlier, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's power to be a witness. Sherry, I, I taught this message, I don't know how long ago it was, but you and I had a conversation about your witnessing in the school. It was, I don't know, I have to look when that message was preached. But I know one of the things that you said at that time as a teacher, you said that there would be students at times that would come up to you and say, there's something different about you. Isn't that cool when someone looks at you and says, there's something different about you? That's an open door. And one of the cool things about being filled with the Holy Spirit, He wants to empower you. Sometimes we feel, you know, ah, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have the strength. Well, He wants to work through you. He wants to flow out of you. He wants to use you in a way to be a witness to other people that are around you, witnessing for Christ. Then I love this one. John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, this is Jesus talking, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. How many like to know that God has brought someone into our lives, that being the Holy Spirit, part of the Trinity, to be your counselor? So often, I need direction. I need insight. I, I need encouragement. And God's given us the Holy Spirit. We've talked over and over and over about how we want to hear God more clearly in, who we, in, in our being, in our spirit man, in our mind, of knowing that God's directing us in a certain way. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, He does, He counsels us. But I love the, also the other term, comforter. I love, Mickey and I both do this. When we're watching a, a movie or a video or something on TV, we both love blankets. Do you like to curl up with a blanket while you watch something? Am I the only one? Come on, don't you love a little blanket? If it's not my wife cuddling up with me, I have that blanket. I just love the warmth of having a blanket around me. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do for us, bring comfort, bring encouragement to us, to give us that, that sense of peace, that some of us are so lacking, even as followers of Christ. How about more fruit? Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, you want to say them with me? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There you are, the fruits of the Spirit. As we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's an opportunity for us to see, become more fruitful. If someone says that they're spirit-filled or filled with the Holy Spirit and they're nasty people, I'm questioning that they must be leaking. We should be some of the most loving, encouraging, gracious people on the planet that say that we are spirit-filled Christians. The gifts should flow. I mean, the fruit should flow out of us. Now let's talk about the gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. I'm not going to read them all today, but... It's so cool that, that as we become filled with the Spirit, there are different gifts that God will bestow upon each one of us. Every one of you have gifts of the Holy Spirit that, want to flow, that He wants to have flow out of you. The fruitfulness and the gifts that are there. Then we love this, old, uh, thing, uh, uh, this part, visions and dreams, which was talked about earlier. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I still see visions. Okay, Don got it. Come on. Visions and dreams. Don't you want to be people? We say we want to see what God's doing. And God at times will use visions and actually dreams to give us direction in our life. 
And the list goes on more and more of what's available to us. How to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that for a few moments. Being born again. Knowing Christ as your Lord and Savior. I, I love this little story. So many of you have heard it, but, but I love telling it because it's one of the times that I lied directly to my wife. I can remember that when we were dating, at, and we were both students at Westminster College, and I, I was a religion major, uh, you know, loving Jesus, born again. And I took my wife, we were, we were out on a date early on in our relationship, so it must have been my junior year at Westminster College. I took her out on a date, and I decided that I was going to take my wife, park, or my wife, my, my, my friend, at that point I was dating, parking. You know what parking is? So, oh, come on, none of you ever did that? <laughs> come on. So we were going to go parking, so we went for a ride, and I stopped the car in a, a little nice little area, and we're talking, and I'm thinking about Mickey, and, and, uh, and she immediately went to the subject and started saying, hey, are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? And, and so I'm sitting there thinking about other things, but she's getting spiritual on me, so here we are, we're talking back and forth, and, and uh, I'm saying, baptized with the Holy Spirit. I don't really remember talking about that or studying that at Westminster College in any of my classes. But immediately I said, oh yeah, I am. And she said, you are? So do you understand what that means? And I said, sure. And she said, so you have a prayer language? I said, sure. And we moved on. So at that point, our relationship probably should have ended. <laughs> Lying man, you know, no. But I was so caught off guard. And, and, and why did I do that? Well, here I am. I'm, I'm a religion major. I'm studying for the ministry. Surely I know things like this. But I didn't. So I eventually went to her and to Leslie, her roommate, and I said, I have to, be, I have to confess. I have really no idea what you're talking about. And that's where my journey began, hearing about what it meant to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So there needs to be a place of, of, of instruction I always like to say as you're preparing to receive the Holy Ghost in the baptism is to have a clear conscience. The Bible says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. I come to a place that I confess. I, I have people confess any known sins. And then forgiveness is important. Sometimes people aren't freed up in the Holy Spirit in receiving and moving in the Holy Spirit because they're lacking forgiveness for others or with others. And then, of course, as you saw in Scripture, the laying of hands. All these things can be a part of what helps us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Three words I like to use. I like to say, ask, surrender, and receive. Making it real simple. Ask, surrender, and receive. Scripture is very clear. I love what Jesus said in Luke 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more... Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to all those who ask him? It's so simple. It's like coming into a relationship with Christ and, and asking him to forgive us, believing what he did through his death, burial, and resurrection, and then stepping out and asking him by faith to be our Savior and our Lord, walking into a relationship, taking that step. It's very simple. It's coming to him and asking him and surrendering and just receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, you may say today, well, Pastor, those are wonderful things that you're talking about, but I did that 20 years ago, and we're good. In fact, I was talking to somebody this week, and as I was talking to this individual, they said, what are you preaching on Sunday? And I said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That again? And I thought to myself, bite your tongue. Don't react. And I started thinking about and processing what that comment was. And this is where I want us to go today as we come. And Andrew, you can bring your team up. I'm ready for you to, to be here and some background music with me. What I want you to think about is this. I think it's great. I can remember when I really got flowing in the Holy Spirit, that was a wonderful time. 
It was up in New York City. It was actually Leslie and Mickey, Leslie's roommate. Leslie was at her parents' house. I can remember where, where God just overwhelmed me with his presence, and I got filled fresh and new in the Holy Spirit. It was an incredible experience. I remember it like yesterday. They were praying around me. They got so tired of me praying that they left and went and had a meal together while I sat in that room praying all by myself with the presence of God in the Spirit. Never forget it. But if I have to keep going back to that experience and not experiencing today a freshness with God, I'm missing something. Number one, the teaching today is important because what do you do if somebody comes to you like they did with Sherry and say, there's something different about you, can you tell me about it? Number one, are they born again? You need to be prepared to share the gospel with them. We've talked about that. But wonder if they're already a Christian. And they're sitting there going, there's something different about you. See, there was something different with Mickey Clausen and Leslie Chislett. These two ladies back there in my junior year, there was something different. There was something different about them. And then when I came to this church and started doing, there definitely was something different about this lady. They, 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 they had something that I didn't. And I started hearing about the fullness of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's why today's teaching is important. What do you do if somebody comes up to you and says, there's something different? Are you ready? It's simple. It's not hard to see somebody come into a, that place of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to come back to you for a moment. Because for us, there's an ongoing feeling needed. If we have to keep going back in our memory to places where way back in that, that 1978 that Rob got filled with the Holy Spirit, really? And that's why there's an ongoing feeling needed. The Bible says very clearly that sin quenches the Spirit. Ephesians 4 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 1 Thessalonians says, do not quench the Spirit. You see, in my life, there are times because of my, my sinful nature, maybe I'm in that line with all the Amish in front of me, and I'm really upset. That can quench the Spirit of flowing in my life. And, and could it be that God wants me to love them instead of, why are you in line? Come on. Why? Could it be that God wants me to be with them? And then the Bible talks about, in Acts chapter 13, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing filling. It doesn't just happen one time and that's it. We leak. We, 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 our sins cause us to quench the Spirit. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. When was the last time that you actually said to God and waited on God, fill me fresh and new today? Fill me fresh and anew today. I just... I want, Lord, all you have for me. I, I, I want to just sense your presence in my life today. As we walk out these four doors, one of my prayers so often is that, that our people will be filled fresh and anew with the presence of God every day. I think it's great that you can say, I sense God. I love the worship. I, I love the team. I love sensing the presence of God here. I think that's great. But what happens tomorrow? Because God wants to do a daily thing with you. It's the Word, and it's His presence. It's God talking to you. He wants to empower you. He wants you to be His witnesses. He just wants you to be filled fresh and anew. Every day, there are things. I tell you about my, my walk with God, but every day, I go to the Lord, and, I, and I, at some point in my time with God, like this morning, early this morning, I confessed my sins. If there was anything that I, that I had done that, I had, that wasn't right, I got it right with God. And if I needed to talk to somebody, I'm going to go talk to them. But I cleared the slate. God, show me if there's things that I've done that aren't right. And you know what I do? 
not long after that, I say, God, fill me fresh and new. Holy Spirit, would you just fill me fresh and anew this day? And, and don't just fill me, fill the people in this church. May you be filled with God's presence and love in your life. And, and it takes time. For me, my hiccup is this. Sometimes I, 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 I get on a pattern and on a roll, and, and, I, and I got so many things planned that day that it can almost become, I just got to get done. I just got to get it done. Move, 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 move. And the Lord, the Lord has really been convicting me and saying, Rob, I so appreciate, I appreciate your time with me. But there are more times, too, that I want you to wait. Remember what I said earlier? But wait. Actually wait. Holy Spirit's not fast food. Just wait. We can turn the lights down. We're just going to go back into that one psalm that Andrew and the team ended with. And we're going to have, what we have around the room, we have on both sides, will be shortly, our altar team. Maybe you're not sure about your relationship with Christ, and we'd love to talk to you about that. That's the beginning step. There's nothing greater than knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and following Him, and loving Him, and experiencing Him on a daily basis. But this whole thing with the Holy Spirit is another place that God wants to move. He wants to move here but he also wants to move on a daily basis in your life because he wants to open up doors for you. He wants to do things in your life. Holy Spirit, today we thank you for your presence. You say where two or three are gathered together that Jesus, you're in the midst, and I believe that's Papa God also, and I believe Holy Spirit that you're here also tonight or right now this morning we come to you we just open ourselves up to you we love you Lord thank you for being our Savior Jesus thank you for what you've done for us and we love you and Holy Spirit even on this Pentecost Sunday we open ourselves up to you we welcome you Holy Spirit Maybe today you've never even taken that initial step and said, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be baptized. Our team around the room here is well equipped to lead you into the presence of God to be filled with this Holy Spirit. I'd like us just to kind of open our hands. I know that we're all seated. And that's okay. Let's just be in this place. Would you just kind of open your heart up right now before the Lord? Take a moment. Say, Jesus, is there anything in my life that I need to confess to you? I'm asking you to forgive me. Show me, Lord, anything that would be a blockage between you and me. Thoughts that have been impure. Words or arguments that I've gotten into. Things that my hands have done that should not have been done. Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, purify me. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you today, even if this is the first time in your life that you've done this, to say, Holy Spirit, I, I ask you to come and fill me fresh and anew this day. Would you baptize me with the Holy Spirit? Would you fill me, God, this day? I surrender. I give my life to you another day. I give my life to you to do whatever you've called me to do. And I receive today the freshness of God in my life. The freshness of God. Just hold your hands out before the Lord to say, fill me fresh, God. May this be one of those encounters today that I'll remember of the freshness of God touching me today.